Okay, so this is an updated video on membrane transport for AP Bio topic 2.5. So when we talk about cell transport, what we're really talking about are two different categories of transport called passive transport and active transport. And what we're looking at is how different molecules move across the cell membrane. So passive transport is simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, basically where molecules are moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. Now the key with passive transport is that it does not require any energy. So there's no ATP required. This passive transport is really due to concentration gradients and the random collisions of molecules as they spread out across a membrane. So we will talk about examples of both of those. And then we also have active transport. Now, as it sounds, active is going to require energy. This could be molecules moving from a low concentration against their concentration gradient from low to high. I often think about this as like pushing something uphill. <laughs> and then there's also bulk transport, which is endo and exocytosis. So in active transport, it does require energy. Now, it's important to keep in mind when we think about molecules, molecules are always in constant motion. They're always moving and bumping and colliding into each other. Now, if you heat something up, they're gonna move faster. If you cool something down, they'll move more slowly. <laughs> and so as molecules start out in like a high concentration, as they randomly collide with each other, we call that diffusion. Now, as molecules move from high concentration to low concentration due to random collisions, um, if it crosses through a, a cell membrane, that's going to be simple diffusion. Now, I also want to point out that sometimes when I read student answers about diffusion, a lot of times uh, they use phrasing like, oh, they need to move or they want to move. No, they don't have feelings and desires and hopes and dreams. These are due to random collisions bouncing into each other. So if we look at this here, we can see in the cell on the left, or the cell membrane, we have a high concentration on the outside of the cell or above the cell membrane. And then through a random collision, some of those molecules are gonna be able to pass right on through that membrane. Now, if you go back to our previous video on permeability, uh, we know that these types of molecules are gonna be small, nonpolar molecules that are able to diffuse right on through those fatty acid tails. Now, eventually over time, they will reach equilibrium. Now, I do wanna point out that once equilibrium is reached across that cell membrane, the molecules don't just stop moving. We're talking, they can move in opposite directions at equal rates. I also wanna point out just because there's a high concentration of molecules and as they collide, you're gonna have a net movement into the cell. There will be some molecules that move in the opposite direction, but overall you'll have more moving in than are moving out. So we often use the phrasing net movement. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at this example here. So check yourself. Molecules with what kind of chemical properties are able to diffuse directly through that membrane? Uh, it's going to be molecules with nonpolar or hydrophobic chemical properties can get right on through that nonpolar center of the membrane. And it's those fatty acid tails that really determine the permeability of the lipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. So some examples of simple diffusion I used in my permeability video is oxygen. So if you breathe in oxygen, you have a high concentration as the oxygen collides, it's going to diffuse across the lipid bilayer and enter into the cell from high to low concentration. Now it's also important to mention that inside our cells we have mitochondria and mitochondria use oxygen. So you pretty much always have a low concentration of oxygen within the cells because it's being consumed during aerobic respiration. So you pretty much always have a net movement of oxygen colliding and diffusing into the cell. Now mitochondria do produce waste during aerobic respiration and they produce carbon dioxide. And we know from our previous video that carbon dioxide is also nonpolar. So as the mitochondria produce carbon dioxide as waste products, they are nonpolar molecules and can just diffuse right on out of the cell. Okay, now one more example that really ties into our unit four on cell communication is going to be our steroid-based hormones. So our steroid-based hormones are also nonpolar, hydrophobic, and so 
when we talk about these hormones, these chemical messengers, cholesterol is often a precursor. Precursor means it's like what they're made from. So you can see how progesterone, testosterone, estrogen are made from cholesterol. And cholesterol is a sterile. And a sterile is nonpolar hydrophobic. So how do we predict that these steroid-based hormones will enter or leave a cell? It's gonna be by simple diffusion. They're gonna be able to cross right on through that lipid bilayer uh, by simple diffusion because they also are nonpolar. Now, what about those polar or hydrophilic molecules or the ions? How do they get through the membrane, right? Into or out of a cell? If we saw the permeability video, we know that they're gonna use protein channels. So my next video in this series will be on facilitated diffusion, where we'll talk more about these protein channels. But basically, molecules like um, glucose or different ions will actually use um, a protein channel, and they still will be based on random collisions and diffuse from high concentration to low concentration, but just through a protein since they are prevented from crossing through those fatty acid tails of the phospholipid bilayer. So what kind of molecules uh, would need a protein to enter or leave a cell? That's gonna be your polar hydrophilic molecules as well as ions and large polar molecules. Okay, so, but here's my next question for you. What if a cell already has a high concentration of ions, for example, let's say calcium, but it needs more, right? So we already know that calcium here as shown is an ion, has a positive charge, so it can't just diffuse into or out of the cell through simple diffusion. Instead, it's gonna need a protein. But here, I'm asking, how does it go from low concentration to high concentration, which is the opposite of simple diffusion? Well, we're gonna require the use of ATP, or cellular energy, or metabolic energy. So ATP is an energy source, and that's gonna be required to pump calcium ions or ions from low concentration to high concentration. We say they're going against their concentration gradient. So this to me is like if you're pumping up a bike tire, you already have a high pressure, lots of air inside that tire, and you're using energy to pump even more air opposite of where it would naturally flow. And so when you see the word pump, they are referencing a protein pump that's requiring energy to move molecules against their concentration gradient. That is a big key right there uh, to let you know it's talking about active transport. So active transport does require energy. Okay, so my next question for you though is why does the concentration gradient, actually I'm gonna leave the answer away, why does the concentration gradient um, remain? Like why does there stay a high concentration of calcium ions inside the cell? Why don't they just diffuse out until they reach equilibrium? right? And that really comes down to that lipid bilayer and those fatty acid tails in the middle of the membrane. The fact that the cell membrane or the plasma membrane is selectively permeable. It only allows some molecules to go through by simple diffusion, small nonpolar molecules, where other ones like these calcium ions with their positive charges remain like kind of locked in place. They are unable to diffuse out. So concentration gradients are able to be established across a membrane because the membrane is semi or selectively permeable. Now this really comes into play in our unit three. So here's an example of a chloroplast in photosynthesis. During photosynthesis, it's really important to build up this proton gradient within the thylakoid. You can see this thylakoid has a lipid bilayer surrounding it. As hydrogen ions accumulate inside, they remain I don't want to use the word trapped, but kind of stuck there. There's only one exit, which is ATP synthase. And so this proton gradient is really important for the plant's production of ATP. We also see a proton gradient in the mitochondria, also in chapter three. Now, why these proton gradients can exist is because of that lipid bilayer preventing ions from just simple diffuse, uh, like simply diffusing out. Okay. So now we're gonna switch gears and we'll look at one last type of movement. So what about large molecules like proteins or particulate matter or bacteria, right? Like how do large molecules enter or leave a cell? So let's go ahead and see. So here I have a nice lipid bilayer or plasma membrane. Let's say I have some large molecules that are too big for a protein channel. 
Uh, maybe they're proteins themselves and they can't cross through a protein channel. Maybe they're bacteria that a white blood cell is going to engulf. Um, so now how would they enter a cell, right? So what actually happens, if we think back to our early videos in unit two, the membrane, remember, is fluid and it's flexible. The cell membrane, the plasma membrane, will actually fold in on itself and rearrange its whole structure to form a vesicle. Now this is inside the cell. What I don't have pictured is a lysosome can actually come over and fuse with this vesicle. If this was like a white blood cell, the lysosome's lipid bilayer can come and fuse with this vesicle and their lipid bilayers would fuse and then you could have hydrolytic enzymes degrading bacteria in white blood cells. Okay, so this process though, of bringing large molecules into a cell is called endocytosis. In endocytosis, the cell takes in large molecules and particulate matter by folding the plasma membrane in on itself and forming new small vesicles uh, that engulf ma material from the external environment. So this um, internal vesicle is surrounded in a lipid bilayer. Now, what about the opposite though? What if I wanted to, if I was like a cell that produces a lot of proteins, maybe they're enzymes. A perfect example would be salivary glands in your mouth. When your mouth waters, there are proteins called enzymes to help digest your carbohydrates. So how do those cells release those proteins into your saliva, right? And so, um, here's just some words, ribosomes make proteins. Proteins are large. How can a protein go through a protein channel? So how would a cell release those large proteins? Well, it's gonna be the opposite of endocytosis. So here we have a vesicle, part of the endomembrane system discussed in topic 2.1. So here you have a vesicle carrying proteins. It's gonna be brought to the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. Those lipid bilayers will fuse and then the proteins will be sent out of the cell in the opposite of endocytosis. So we call this process exocytosis, where they're being released from the cell. This is also how neurotransmitters are released from neurons. Neurotransmitters are so stored in vesicles and are brought to the um, surface of the, of the neuron and are released into the synapse uh, for cell communication. Okay, so in exocytosis, uh, internal vesicles release materials from cells by fusing with the plasma membrane, <laughs> sorry, fusing with the plasma membrane and secreting large molecules from the cells. Now, I want you to think about these two types of bulk transport, endocytosis and exocytosis. Are these considered passive or active? Now, in my video, I didn't show ATP anywhere, right? Uh, but it's kind of, I think, logical to follow that it would require some energy, some ATP, to rearrange an entire cell membrane. So endo and, act, endo and exocytosis do fall under the category of active transport. Okay, okay, that is my video on membrane transport and hopefully it was helpful and great job.